very much, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So today I'm going to talk about the new project, joint work with Amit Karmani, who is a colleague at Berkeley. It's great to use the boom and bust. Let me start with some motivation. So the Great Recession was preceded by a large expansion of credit, and was then followed by a boom and bust in real economic activity. What I mean with that is that both house prices, employment, and consumption first increased in the period 2002 up to 2006, 2007, and then there was a sharp decline starting in 2007. Okay. So if we think about the magnitude, we can look first at the household debt. Well, if we look at the US flow of funds, we see that the household debt doubled during the boom by an increase by an amount of $5.7 trillion. Okay. And the, the following collapse, uh, for example, for the employment, so unemployment increases was the greatest one with respect to any other recession in the gas, and peaked the 10% in October 2009. However, the interesting factor is that not all the US are equal in this factor, but there are gonna be states or countries that experience a much larger increase and then a much sharper collapse in both credit, house prices, consumption, and employment. So let me start by showing you the average across all the US. Okay, so this is the total debt balance and the composition for the households in the US. So the yellow line, the yellow bars are gonna be the mortgages, then you have the home equity revolving, then you have the auto loans, the credit card, and student loans. So you see that basically there is uh, a very significant increase starting in 2003 up to the peak is about 2000, the third quarter of 2008. And then there is a sharp decline. Now everything would be fine if this increase in household debt was not followed by also an increase in delinquency when we start basically the financial crisis, when we start the recession. So if we look at delinquency, by type of credit, we see that they, those start, start increasing in 2007. And in particular, the ones that are the most significant ones are the mortgage and the credit cards. So it seems that basically these households became, during the boom, more fragile to any potential shock, for example, to lower income, and then and they started basically defaulting on all these debt. Well, the part that I'm gonna show you is that not all the US are gonna be equal, in particular, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So this is the total debt balance, exactly the one that I showed you before, but it by looking at the different states. So we see that the ones that are the most hit by the boom and bust in terms of credit are the Nevada, California, New Jersey, Arizona, and so on. Okay. Much less for Texas, uh, New York. So thus, to increase in credit supply also corresponds to an increase in delinquency. Well, what we observe is yes. So if we see the same, if we look at the same graph in terms of delinquency rates, we see that exactly the region, the states, in which we observe the huge increase and then decline in the credit supply are also the ones that experience a larger increase in the limits. Nevada, uh, Florida, California, New York. Okay. Oh, what does this gap suggest? That there is a relation between uh, giving credit probably to the riskier borrowers, to subprime borrowers, and what happens in the real economic activity. But in order to show you a better correlation, something that we can capture with the two graphs. Basically, the, up, the, the one that upper graph is showing you the total mortgage liabilities per capita for three types of regions. The ones with the high debt above the median, the average, and then the low debt, the blue line. Yeah, thus, to this, exactly to this region corresponds also an increase in house prices and then a more sharp decline. Yes, it does. So the red line is first run up in house prices for regions with very high debt <coughs> for the households, and then they the same happens for the average and low debt, but at much lower magnitude. The same happens also if we look at one of the measures for consumption, so for example, car sales. These are car sales, and what this shows is that there is basically no difference in the period between 2000 up to 2002, 2003, between different regions. So the car sales increased by the same amount all over the place, but then starting in 2002, you see that regions with very high household debt started consuming more cars, so the consumption in those regions was much higher, which makes sense. But the, unfortunately, after basically the collapse of the housing market, we also see that the sharper the reduction in consumption is actually in the same states. Finally, if I show you house prices, I show you consumption, I'm also gonna show you employment. So employment is exa exactly the same type of graph. So the first line is gonna be the regions with the high level of debt. The middle region is one for the average, and then the lower, uh, the lower line is for the one for the low level of debt we see that there is a huge increase in the employment and then the sharp decline. Now the question is that, 
we see that there is a relation between the credit markets, in particular the mortgage market, and uh, what happens in the real world, what happens in real economic activity in terms of prices, employment, and consumption. So our, we are asked the following question. What is the role of financial markets in making these fluctuations much more severe? In particular, how much of the observed disruption in the, both the financial market and the real economic, in the real economic activities are due to the outward shift in the credit supply? So is that true that these banks are actually giving loans to riskier borrowers? And this makes these borrowers more fragile once we enter into the recession. Unfortunately, it's very challenging. Why? Because if we look at the relation between <coughs> credit, house, house prices, employment, and consumption, these three are going to be related anyway, even if there is no relation working through the credit market. I'll give you an example. So suppose that we are in a county or in a state that is experiencing very high growth rates. What's going to happen is that people are just going to ask for more credit. I'm going to invest, I'm going to consume, employment is going to go up. So this means that basically there is a relationship between all these three variables, but it's not going to work through what the banks do, but it's going to work through the demand for credit. Okay. So trying to understand this entangle of these two effects is going to be the main job that we're after. Okay. So what do we do? We take advantage of some regula regulatory uh, changes that happened in the early 2000s in the US. First, Starting in 1999, several states adopted uh, what they are called uh, anti predatory laws. I'm going to go into details, but what these do is basically they restrict the access to credit for risk borrowers. Unfortunately, what happened is that in 2004, the OCC, which is the Office of Controller and Currency, preempted all these laws. So what they say is that all national banks in the US are actually not subject to these anti predatory laws, which means that starting in 2004, national banks in this state were able to uh, give, uh, give credit to riskier borrowers, while everybody else, state banks, for example, with credit unions, were to do it. Okay. So we are going to use exactly this time frame, this period, after 2004, as a shock to the credit supply. So national banks are going to be the key drivers of giving credit to riskier borrowers. So let me show you one thing. So regulatory framework in the US is given by the following. So different type of banks are actually subject to different agencies. <coughs> For example, national banks are subject to the Office of Controller and Currency, and this is the only one that is under the jurisdiction of the Treasury Department. Then there are state banks that are under the Federal Reserve System or the Federal Deposit Insurance, or uh, then the finally there is are also the credit union, and they are under their own agency, which is called the National Credit Union Association. The problem is that in 2004, there was a federal law, which was called the Home Ownership Equity Protection Act. And what they tried to do, basically they were trying to limit the access to loans for risk borrowers. They were limiting, for example, the interest rate, the fees, and so on. Unfortunately, the thing is that what they called high cost mortgages was determined by looking at the interest rate for these mortgages, but was the threshold was too high. So basically, this federal law was never actually applied in the US. So what happened is that since 1999, a bunch of different states implemented different anti-federal laws, which, are, which were actually much more stringent than the federal one. The first one was North Carolina. And what they asked, and then by 2007, 29 states, two plus the District of Columbia, had anti anti laws. So there is a huge variation. There are states that do have them, for example, New York, Massachusetts, Illinois, and there are states that all have very <coughs> weak anti laws. Or have not. So we are going to focus on the states uh, that have anti-predatory laws and have anti-predatory laws that look at purchase loans rather than refinancing loans. So what happened in 2004? So in January 2004, the Bush administration decided, working through the Treasury Department and the Office of Controller and Currency, decided that every U.S. household should have access to credit in order to have help. So what they decided is that the only thing that they could do is actually preempt all these regulations. So what they did say was saying all the banks that are national, that are under the OCC, they are not going to have any restriction. Any restriction in an awful different dimension. For example, they, are, they, cannot, they can give you loans without any documentation, without looking at your repayment ability, without looking at your loan to value ratio. They have no restriction in terms of disclosure. 
advertising, uh, having access to your credit report. So basically they can do whatever they want. Yeah. That's it was important. So we are, for example, in New York, <coughs> you're from Massachusetts, where I come from, so you are gonna have the Cambridge Trust, who is under, who is not under the OCC, who cannot actually give loans to riskier borrowers, but Citibank there can. Okay. So the data, so from here we have a, a very good real estate center, so we have access basically to all data at the loan level for all the US, from starting 1999 up to 2011, we have the loan application, it was approved or not, the interest rates, demographics about what the applicants and so on. So we have a, a lot of different characteristics. We also know if the loan was securitized or not. We know the FICO score of the borrower. For example, this is a risky borrower or not. And then we also <laughs> add to this data set data about, for example, counting business patterns. So for example, the employment and the investment and the consumption at the county level. So what we are gonna do, we are gonna, gonna show you with this picture. So this is the map of the US by counties, with different counties having different exposure to national banks. So for each county, basically what we did was looking at what is the fraction of loans that is originated by national banks. So darker counties are the ones where national banks are more important, and are the ones where we expect <coughs> the national banks are gonna give credit to riskier borrowers, so are those where we expect the boom and bust cycle to be much more severe. And if we use also the FPL, the FPL laws, so the, the anti-predatory laws, so the blue are basically the <coughs> different borders for the states with anti-predatory laws. We can also compare, for example, different counties that are in two different states, very close to the border, in a state without anti-predatory laws and state with predatory laws. <coughs> so let me show you the first main result. The first main result, uh, you, can, you can see this uh, from this graph, is this is the difference between how much credit is given in a county with a high presence of national bank versus a county with a low presence of national bank. The interesting thing is that there is basically no difference between these two types of counties before 2004. Then starting in 2004 with this preemption rule, what happened is that there is a huge increase in the credit uh, given to riskier borrowers in states with anti-predatory laws and counties where national banks are very important. So this preemption rule actually did give a positive shock to the credit supply, and now we are gonna see what happens to the real economy after this. Just to give you a sense of the magnitude. So if we compare counties in the, where there are a lot of national banks versus counties in the bottom, so below the median, we are gonna see that after 2004, they increase their credit supply by 11% every year. So does this have an effect on real economic activity? Yes, it does, and it's also very strong. So for example, if we look at house prices, in those same counties, we see that house prices increase by 12% and then decrease by the same amount. So there is exactly the same effect on the house prices. Then we looked at the employment. So if we see that basically we are giving more credit to risk borrowers, it might also be that these people are actually investing so we should observe that there are more severe fluctuations in employment as well. And this is what we see. That maybe there is an increase, a 10% increase in the credit supply, increase employment in those counties by 2%. Okay. And we're gonna look at the non-tradable sector. Why non-tradable sector? These are, for example, retail or services. And because we wanna look at sectors where employment is not affected by external factors, but only by US demand. Finally, there is, a, there is also a piece of evidence about delinquencies. So everything would be fine if we observe these fluctuations, but there wouldn't be any inefficiency in some sense if we didn't observe some uh, sort of effect on delinquency. What we observe is the following. That first, delinquency go down during the boom and then go up. Why do they go down? Because suppose you are in a county in which you have a lot of access to national banks, they are gonna give you credit for free at very good terms without looking at your documentations. Then instead of defaulting <laughs> your credit debt, you can just increase your debt balance by using the new credit to repay the old credit. So we should observe that during the boom, delinquency actually go down in counties where there are a lot of national banks. And this is exactly what we observe. So there is a huge decrease by 15% in delinquency rates during the boom, but then all this effect becomes even stronger 
during the recession. So during the recession, we get exactly the reverse. So since all these riskier borrowers increased their household debt in order to avoid defaulting during the boom, and because they had access to this credit, they start defaulting much more. And so there is an increase by 30% during the recession, starting from the zero. So let me conclude with this. So who knows who is this guy? Yes, that is the angel on the left. Yes, so he's not a gangster, even if he looks like one, but he's basically the CEO of Country Wise until 2008. And he has been blamed as the first guy to be blamed by, at least by the time, as the guy to be blamed for the housing debacle. However, what this paper suggests is that there is a role also for the regulators. Because it's true that he did a bunch of different things, immoral or illegal, but it's also true that at a certain point, uh, we took a stand and we decided not to regulate national banks, for whatever reason, in particular was to give access to households, to all the households to a mortgage, to a house, but this basically made everybody much more fragile to never be shot. So what I wanna, in the end, I wanna finish by saying that what really this paper is about is showing that regulation in this market is crucial and is my actual increase in the